So um, you've heard about uh, from Gavin about our predictive cloud platform that's comprised of the um, uh, you know the, the multi-cloud flash fabric and the predictive analytics provided by Infosight. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit about Infosight as a background, and then we'll have uh, our um, uh, chief data scientist, Dr. David Adamson, give you a bit of a demo on some of the underlying uh, data science and uh, machine learning that we do. And then I'll come back and finish it off with a, a little bit of uh, uh, update on our six nines. There we go. OK, you guys, I'm sure probably everybody has seen this at uh, one point in their life. Nobody likes it. It's frustrating and annoying. Uh, we have it happen to us. Um, when it happens to us, uh, maybe when we're trying to do a Google map or something on the web, uh, for us, that's frustrating. We, maybe we get a little bit upset. But when that sort of thing happens to a business, and by that we mean either data is not available or it's not available fast, it's not just frustrating. It can be very business impacting. In today's digital economy, customers or, or systems or companies like Uber, uh, if they're not getting data in a timely manner, that's impacting revenue directly. And so this is a, uh, something that we endeavor to solve. We call it the app data gap. But through uh, providing our Flash platform to hopefully take uh, performance off of the table, and then predictive analytics with Infosight. Because not all problems are with storage. What we've actually found, we did a study about a year ago, and over half of the problems that we actually deal with in the support organization have nothing to do with our array. It's something else in that infrastructure. And the, the impact is the same. It doesn't matter where it's coming from. We're endeavoring to solve that issue up the stack. It's always a storage. <laughs> it's a, it's a, so it's, it's about 46% uh, of the time, of like about 12,000 cases that we looked at were actually storage related. The rest was configuration elements within the environment, uh, integration issues, maybe with Exchange or what have you. The fact is, is this guy who's the admin, he's getting frustrated, constantly reacting to these unexpected problems. Uh, you know, being up late at night, maybe ruining his weekends, not being able to make it to his kid's soccer game. Uh, and, and a lot of these IT departments nowadays have maybe more than one, maybe many monitoring tools, um, maybe log analytics tools and so forth, where they're trying to do this correlation of all of this data themselves to really try to get to the root cause of that issue and get it solved. The problem is humans can't grok all that stuff anymore. It's just too complex. And so being able to understand that and up-level it for our customers is really an absolute imperative uh, for us. Pardon me. The, the, the last thing this poor guy does is contact his vendor for their help in solving his issue. So when they, and oftentimes that can make matters even worse for that guy. You know, what happens there is they, in a traditional support model, he'll be talking to a level one uh, technical support engineer who may be asking rather mundane or irrelevant questions about the issue, uh, maybe then getting escalated up a level uh, to the level two guy who's asking some of the same questions, hopefully a little bit more technically deep questions to get to the root cause. But nonetheless, it's a frustrating experience for that person. And worst of all, what can happen here is, let's say this was a performance problem that maybe happened an hour ago, and he's calling his vendor for help. If that issue isn't happening right now, and they don't have data, deep data, when it did happen, the support person is going to ask him to reproduce the problem or let's wait until it happens again. That's not a great answer for that poor guy who's going to wait again to have that disruption potentially to his revenue stream at his company. It's not an acceptable answer. So I'm going to do a bit of an analogy here to uh, the, our transportation system. We've all had this problem too, where we're a frustrated driver. We're getting stuck in traffic because of an accident, where maybe we're missing our appointment because the bus didn't get us there on time. We're all used to that, or we've all experienced some form of this. But it's changing. The autonomous self-driving car, it is here. It's here to, to stay. It'll make a difference to the experience in that trans transportation system. We feel that that's the same opportunity we have with infrastructure. Why can this not be the way we do infrastructure in the future? By having that same rich telemetry that those cars have around them and being aware of everything around them, what's going on with other cars, 
uh, with passenger, uh, sorry, with pedestrians and so forth, being able to take that rich telemetry, analyze it, and make recommendations and decisions that they're informing those actuators in the car to drive correctly, we should be able to take that same deep data that we have across our install base with the global learning that we have the ability to do with the analytics on it and really provide a self-driving autonomous infrastructure. So let's just look back a little bit in time what we've done here at Nimble. So we started uh, almost seven years ago now with collecting deep data. We have over almost 4,000 uh, sensors embedded into Nimble OS and into the Castle file system. And we've been collecting this information for almost seven years. In fact, uh, in about a month from now, on April 15th, tax day, you're all aware of that day, but it's a historic day for us as well, not because we all pay our taxes here, hopefully, but it was the first day that we installed a Nimble array, seven years ago. So that data has started coming in almost seven years ago now. And it is, one thing we learned along the way and uh, is borne out by the, the facts that I told you with less than half of our cases being about storage, it's imperative that we understand other things and other elements in that infrastructure. And so about three years ago, we introduced VM Vision within InfoSight where we're collecting the same type of data all the way up that vSphere stack, all the way up to the virtual machines, the VMDKs, uh, data stores, and so on. So that's kind of the evolution from 2010 and all the way to, to today where we're collecting all of that information up the stack and providing that predictive analytics uh, driving uh, our, our uh, uh, customer experience. So let me uh, just walk through the value we give back to our customers. So what does it all mean to them? So we have the ability to predict and prevent, um, and we actually open and resolve with pre prescriptive recommendations back to our customer 86% of the issues in the support organization. We have global visibility across the entire install base and are able to learn from one customer and apply that learning to all customers. Our fundamental tenant within InfoSight and support is that if we know of an issue, if we, maybe we found it in a support lab, QA lab, or at a customer site, if we've seen it once, it's our goal to not let that happen to anybody else in the world. And that's a huge factor in driving our 6.9's availability. And finally, and this is kind of um, probably the one thing that I'm most proud of at Nimble, and that is we provide support you actually like. And I, I would say it's love, not even like. We get time and time again, day after day, unsolicited feedback from our customers that they just absolutely love the support experience and wish that everybody could provide the same level of support that we do amongst their vendors within the data center. Um, so 54%, again, is the number of cases we solve outside of storage. And because we have all of that information and a very high level um, uh, engineering team within support, we have no tearing whatsoever. They're all level three engineers. We're able to solve that issue when that uh, TSE takes the case. We do no handoff. We do no tearing up the uh, support structure at all. Every engineer solves the problem that they get in the queue or if a customer calls in. So how is InfoSight different? So I think there, there's four main uh, things that differentiate InfoSight from other competitors in our space that are trying to do the same thing InfoSight does. You're probably all aware um, many of the other vendors in, in our uh, field are trying to emulate it. They even call us out by name. They try to tell their customers that they're better than InfoSight. Um, the, the fact of the matter is we have been doing this right from the start. It's, it's just like if, if you were to take a look at a, at a car, that autonomous car, you can't uh, have a self-driving car when that car was built in the 80s. It's impossible. You have to have had all of those sensors built in uh, right from the start, and that's, that's where we came from. I mean, we recognized early on that this was going to be absolutely essential to providing that different experience to our customers. And again, awareness beyond storage is absolute paramount for us uh, to, to provide that level of support to our customers. And with all that data, you know, there's, there's all these tools that are available for, other for, for uh, the IT infrastructure to sort of monitor and, and graph trends of, of IOPS and throughput and so on. 
And of course, InfoSight in, in, the, uh, in the portal provides that sort of information, but much more importantly is the data science that we apply to all of that underlying sensor data that we have and really make meaningful insights available in that portal, portal to our customers. It, it's no good to just know that your latency's not performing well. You have to understand why and be able to get to root cause very effectively, quickly, and, and then hopefully avoid the whole problem altogether. And that's what the machine learning and data sciences do for us uh, within this infrastructure. And then finally, prescriptive recommendations are what it's all about. We really want to be proactive about telling our customers uh, either prescriptive answers on how to avoid a problem if they've seen it, but more importantly, how to make sure they don't hit the problem in the first place. Um, and I'll tell you uh, a, a quick uh, anecdote from one of our latest health checks that we put in the system. Uh, this is a, an example where it was nothing to do with the root cause being in the storage side, but rather on the host side. So it was with converged infrastructure um, under certain workload conditions over a very particular um, configuration for fiber channel and so on, and a very particular configuration on the, on the um, converged infrastructure side, not on the array side, that you could hit an all, down, all paths down condition under a very particular workload. We recognized that, we worked with that, uh, that vendor to understand the root cause and where it was in, in their system. But we created cases for about 100 customers proactively before they hit that issue and instructed them on the change they needed to make on their host side to avoid that issue altogether. So that's just a great example of that prescriptive recommendations that we make when they're not a storage related problem, but that we're always compelled to take care of for our customers.